Hello there, my name is Gary Sims, Android Authority, and today I'm going to try and answer the question, what is the Internet of Things? The Internet as we know it is going to change. Today it's a massive global network that allows people to communicate with each other. We send emails, we send instant messages, we use websites to communicate, to share data, and it is the people who drive the Internet. The data that we send comes from client devices like a laptop or a PC or a tablet or a smartphone and it goes to some servers and the servers then transmit that data, that information on further. In that sense we can say that the internet is made up of three major actors, the people, the client devices they use and the servers. But a whole new category of actor is being added to the internet. They've been unglamorously called things, hence the term internet of things. So what is a thing? Well really it's any object that has a sensor attached to it that can transmit the data from that sensor further up into the internet, into the cloud, where it can be analysed and used to make decisions. Examples of such sensors include temperature sensors, traffic sensors, flow rate sensors, energy usage monitors and so on. A temperature sensor can be placed in a smart thermostat, a smart electricity usage meter can be wired into a house, or a traffic monitor can be placed into a traffic signal. These things then send data further up the chain until either a person or a piece of computer software makes a decision based on that data. It won't be long and maybe it's already happened, but there will be more things on the internet sending data around than actual people using internet enabled devices. The cell phone, the internet, email, social media and smartphones have all changed the way we do things, both at a personal level and at a business level. Clearly the Internet of Things will do the same thing. Our personal lives and our professional lives will be affected. How they'll be affected isn't fully yet understood, but for sure it will change things. There are several big challenges ahead for the embryonic Internet of Things. There are technological challenges in terms of the actual devices that collect and send data. These challenges include both hardware and software issues like battery life, maintenance, interoperability and compatibility. There are big data issues around building systems that can process all this data and use it to achieve meaningful tasks. There are also security and privacy problems. Who wants to have a smart home that can be hacked? Nobody does. Or worse still, a smart hospital that can be breached remotely. As we move from the individual smart homes to smart cities, which have smart transport systems and smart infrastructure, then all these issues become more complex and more difficult to solve correctly. The reality of the Internet of Things from a consumer point of view took a giant leap forward this year when Samsung's co-CEO took to the stage at CES 2015 to declare that all Samsung products will be Internet of Things enabled within five years. If 2020 sounds like a long way off to you, he also said that 90% of Samsung's products would be able to connect to the web by 2017. Samsung's plans are for every washing machine, every air conditioning unit and every microwave oven to be IoT enabled. And five years from now, every single piece of Samsung hardware will be an IoT device, whether it is an air purifier or an oven. In his speech, the co-CEO also highlighted that the IoT experience needs to be seamless for the consumer. The IoT experience has to be seamless. I predict that this journey to the seamless experience will be quite bumpy. However, there are companies like Arm who are trying their best to smooth out the road as we go. Towards the end of 2014, Arm announced a new operating system to boost the development of IoT devices. Called Embed OS, it's a free operating system for Arm's Cortex-M range of microcontrollers. One of the key points about Embed OS is that it supports the important IoT protocols and allows anybody from a hobbyist developer to a multi-million dollar corporation to prototype and develop IoT devices. Embed OS will include all the functionality needed to create an IoT device and to transmit that data to the cloud. It supports a lot of different communication stacks including IPv4, IPv6, 6 low pan, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, 2G GSM and 3G. The interesting thing about Embed OS is that it falls into a very special class of operating system. When we think about a smartphone, it comes with an operating system like Android, and Android itself is built on Linux. And Linux is what we call a multitasking operating system. 
And the resources in a modern day smartphone are quite large. You've got a quad core, maybe an octa core processor, you've got a GPU, you've got one gigs, two gigs, three gigs of RAM, maybe eight gigs of internal storage and so on. A typical IoT device will have a processor that runs at just 100 megahertz, not 1.5 gigahertz or 2 gigahertz like a smartphone. It will only have maybe 4K of memory or 96K of memory. In the biggest case, it's 256K of memory. And that's very different to 3 gigabytes of memory that we see in a smartphone. It'll only have a tiny bit of storage, maybe 32K, 64K or flash storage. That means that Internet of Things devices need a special type of operating system. So I said there were four types of operating system. The multitasking operating system is like Android and like Linux. There's another type of operating system which is called an RTOS, or a real-time operating system. These are found in very small embedded devices that you get in cars, in planes, in industrial applications, and they are a specialist type of operating system that worries about how the scheduler works, how things happen, in what order they happen, whether they happen within a certain time constraint. Now that sounds good for IoT, but that kind of system can be quite battery hungry or not very power efficient. Another approach is called the bare metal approach. It really isn't an operating system in itself. Basically, you have a loop that goes round and round and round and round and round for infinity, and you run your code inside that loop, checking everything and just doing everything. If you've used an Arduino, you'll be familiar with that kind of idea. The problem is that can't be maintained once the project gets particularly large. It also doesn't allow for scheduling, it doesn't allow for certain other things as well. So it has its limitations. And that brings us to the fourth type of operating system, which is a low power operating system. An operating system that's designed just to conserve power while performing its functions. Typically these operating systems are event driven rather than using polling, always checking to see what's going on. And that's the kind of category that the embed OS fits into. And it's very useful for Internet of Things devices. So what does the Internet of Things look like in terms of its structure? It's quite simple. At the thing end, you have a small device which monitors something, a door, a window, a heart rate monitor, a temperature monitor, whatever. These devices transmit that data to another more complicated device. It could be a smartphone, it could be a control unit of some kind, like a smart thermostat, or it could be a dedicated device that acts as a gateway to the internet. This last category of device is known as an IoT gateway. They are important because the sensors often don't have a direct connection to the internet. They probably only have Bluetooth or some other low power connectivity like Zigbee. Once the IoT gateway has received the data from the sensor, it can be sent further up into the cloud. Part of ARM's strategy can be seen with its Embed OS device server. While a web server would accept connections from web browsers running on PCs or smartphones, the Embed OS device server handles connections from IoT devices. It uses open source protocols including HTTP for data communication and for device management. The Embed OS device server would sit behind an IoT gateway and would use the gateway to talk to the IoT devices. It can also send the collected data higher up into the cloud. Imagine you wanted to control the temperature in your house. Your air conditioning unit will be monitoring the temperature and either keeping it at a certain level or it will be programmed to come on at a set hour. This data is collected and sent up to the cloud via an IoT gateway, via a server, for you to monitor via the web or on your smartphone. If you manage to get out of work early, you might want to switch on the air conditioning earlier so that the house is nice and cool when you arrive. You can send that command via your smartphone and it will be relayed back down the chain to the unit. You can imagine other scenarios about the same thing to do with traffic control, street lighting and so on and so on. This all sounds very utopian, but of course there are dangers. With all these devices sending data and receiving commands, it won't be long before the hackers are drawn in. A recent security report from Intel's McAfee Labs singled out IoT as a potential area for security problems. The report says that IoT related attacks will increase due to the predicted fast growth of the number of connected devices, many of which will unfortunately have poor levels of security. In 2013 at a White Hat security conference, it was demonstrated that you could hack webcams that were connected to the internet and the hackers were able to watch what was going on with the webcams. 
Last year there were several different reports about baby monitors that had been hacked and the attackers were watching the video feed of the babies in their rooms. In extreme cases they were even screaming at the babies and waking them up and frightening them. Last year the BBC ran a story about a website that was dedicated just to streaming video feeds from hacked webcams and baby monitors. This is creepy and quite disturbing, but unfortunately it's the world that we live in. However, moving on. Another important concept of the Internet of Things is M2M or machine to machine. At one level, M2M is what it says it is, a way for one machine to talk to another machine. However, in this context it means how a connected device talks to the cloud. It also includes how these devices are managed. M2M isn't new in the sense that we are all used to one device talking to another. File transfers over Bluetooth, app updates over Wi-Fi, even emails are examples of how one machine talks to another machine to achieve a specific task. However, the special thing about M2M in terms of Internet of Things is that these connected devices have A, a low power usage, B, aren't always on or awake, and C, are limited in terms of their resources, like processing power and memory and so on. All this technology sounds great for the consumer, but probably the big money is to be made on larger scale projects. Smart buildings, smart cities, and IoT-enabled businesses are where the large contracts are to be won. Whole infrastructures enabled for IoT or end-to-end -end business processes using IoT at every step. Everything from garbage to electricity, from trams to taxis, from parcels to production lines can be built to use IoT. The initial investment will be higher for businesses, however the benefits will likely save money in the long term. So the IoT revolution has just started and there's going to be lots of advancements over the next few years. It's going to be interesting to watch the journey until we reach the seamless IoT experience. And I'm sure along the way we're going to see some great innovation coming from some surprising sources. My name's Gary Soons from Android Authority. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Also, please use the comments below to tell me what you think about IoT. Also, don't forget to subscribe to Android Authority's YouTube channel. And as for me, I'll see you in my next video.